Today I'm talking to Tim Sekou. He's the founder and CEO of TintUp. They're a self-service platform that allows organizations to create social hubs in minutes and engage audiences anywhere uh, by monitoring hashtags on social media, which you can go into more detail on what that is in a second. Um, but he also has a very interesting story. Um, he's been building this company up for a few years now, and he started as a B2B company before moving to B2B, or B2C company before moving to B2B. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's just super interesting and I wanted to jump into that with him. So Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks. Appreciate you having me and, uh, excited to share some stories and practical advice that, uh, the listeners can take and practice. Awesome. So let's, let's start right there then. Don't want to bury the lead or anything. So you, you started as a B2C company. What did that look like? Yeah. So in 2012, um, started a company in the B2C side, um, it was called Hypemarks, and essentially the main premise of that was to create a consumer product that um, allowed users to discover web content more efficiently and effectively. And so the idea was um, we would build a technology, a software, a website that would pull in all the sort of like social media content that you shared and allow you to categorize them and have it all stored within our website and you would have a user profile and the idea of that so you can follow people and be able to discover um, content more effectively and efficiently by having it categorized and having it been recommended by your friends. Um, yeah, the target users as, as something that uh, I, I smile at is because um, it was all over the place and that was uh, one of the main mistakes I made um, when I started the company which was I really was building a, a solution versus a problem um, and so with that, um, the the fault uh, was was shown uh, when you when I couldn't really answer who the target market was, and so I started making up saying like, oh, you know, it's maybe like eighteen to twenty four year old college kids that um, just because that was that was a profile I fell under, and that was something that I wanted to use versus trying to solve a problem for a specific industry or specific group or demographic that really made sense. And so to answer your question, it was all over the place, and it was interesting because it was all over the place. We actually found. Um, a product market fit afterwards, but I can share more into that as well. Yeah. So, what were some of the problems that you were running into? Like, why, why even try to change? Um, was the market not working? Was it monetization? Like, what, yeah. was, what were the main issues? Yeah. So, we launched the product um, around March of 2012. Um, we were actually were able to raise some money. That's a whole nother story. But we were able to raise some money in May of 2012, and then we launched it officially out to the public. So it was in beta first in March and then fully launched in July. And um, fast forward a little bit, within December of 20, no, maybe like November of 2012, um, we actually had closed it down and actually launched a whole new product. So we only really let it live for like five months max. Um, and so that pretty much answers your the question that you're asking of like what were the problems we were facing, which is one, um, we just weren't growing fast enough to potentially raise um, a Series A funding because as consumer products, you need to either have you know some crazy good growth numbers or a plan for monetization. And we had plans for monetization, but even that was like questionable. So then we really need to focus on growth. And the, the amount of growth we were trying to get within the first few months just and that trajectory didn't show that we would be able to hit that to be able to raise a Series A to be able to survive. Was it the, so uh, that happened. Was it the investors yeah, that were pointing out the issue or what? Like how did they no, react they to this whole thing? They definitely pro. They definitely like like when we raised our seed round, they basically said like, "Hey, you have these milestones that you probably need to hit to get to even be close to be able to achieve a Series A." And those numbers were like way high from what we were trying to be able to get. What we were able to achieve within the first three months, I'd say. And so that was a big sign that we. That was one sign that we were like, okay, maybe this won't work from from a pure like survival um, perspective. Um, the other thing was that we actually had like three other competitors launch right in July when we launched. It was like, call it irony or call it like luck, but um, they just launched all at the same time. And so like one, one thing that really um, got me to realize like maybe this wouldn't work was that um, when I would try to grow the amount of user base, I would try to reach out to like a bunch of press and um, try to get them to write about us. And they actually started using the title and the subject line of the articles that they published as... You know, Height Marks is like a uh, competitor A name, um, but does this just a little bit differently. And when you hear that and see that, um, yeah, it's great to get pressed, but like when you, when you see that, that's a signal that 
the market doesn't see you really solving a problem different from the, the, the competitive landscape. And our competitors have raised like maybe a couple million dollars, so they were growing faster than we were. So that was even another sign that things weren't working. And so when those two triggered and that happened, and I realized that um, I had to take a step back and ask myself, like, is this really a problem that we're solving for people? Um, is there an actual valid problem that people would pay for it in the future or that would justify the amount of growth that we needed? And um, all sort of pointed to no. And so we needed to kind of sit back, sit down and like look at everything and assess like what needed to be changed. What was the original uh, monetization model? Was it uh, pay per like tweet or? Yeah. So like, so like even when we collected all, yeah, all, when we collected all the content, we could add affiliate links to them. We can add sponsored content, injecting sponsored content into the site. There's definitely ways to do that. And those are just like, to be completely frank, those were just like researched monetization opportunities that I've, I've looked at versus like, like realistic um, monetization strategies that we could have actually practiced. So how's that compared to now? Like what, what was the, um, was there a turning point? Was there a certain day where it just hit you that you're like, oh, this isn't going to work? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was in August or September that we, my team and I sat down and we're like, okay, this clearly isn't working. Something needs to change. I don't know what it is yet, but something needs to change. And so we, what we did was we, we went back to phase one and step one of like, okay, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And we were even lost on that. So then what I did was I went to our database and looked through all the users about that time and maybe like 1,500 users. So we had 1,500 emails to look at like some of the name big brands that they had signed up that had signed up because maybe they saw a press article of it and they wanted to sign up. And then I reached out to, you know, maybe like 20% of them and then just asked them like, Hey, I know you signed up. Um, you know, did you find anything interesting? Did you find something that was very useful? And one of them came back, uh, was a celebrity management agency based in Los Angeles. And they were saying like, Hey, we signed up for your product because we thought the premise of like social media engagement was very interesting, that we could reuse all the social media content and have it live somewhere, but we don't like it that it's living on your website. Um, we're actually having a new client website being released, and we'd like to have that website um, have your technology on it. And so essentially embedding all the social media content onto um, that celebrity's website. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. Um, one, it's a great opportunity to get a lot of exposure, but two, um, you know, maybe there's a problem here. And so we dissected it that, that the problem there was like people wanted to have engaging dynamic websites, but it would take a lot of time and work into building that out. And so embedding our technology as a, and then licensing that um, could be an answer. And so that's where it all started. So you built it for that one client? We did just build it for that one client with the understanding of, uh, with, the, with the question of if it could, if it could um, be, replicated within other clients or other brands. And so they, they, I asked them like, hey, would you be interested in using this for all, all your other clients? And they said, there is possibility here. So that was one positive sign. And then the other thing is I was, as we were building that out, I was simultaneously emailing out other brands that, had been, that I had reached out with and justifying or validating with them like, hey, if we built this, would this be something of interest to you to actually use? And if they said yes, then I would say like, would you be interested in paying for that? And if there was a yes, there was a positive sign, which there were a few, so we started continually moving forward that path. Did you get any negative feedback when you were changing? So like you had these 1,500 users or whatever, um, you know, you might be higher, might be lower, but um, were they pissed at you when you decided to switch on them? Like were they in? This? Yeah, no, there, was definitely, there was definitely power users that were on the website like all the time. And I was like very impressed. I was like, wow, there's people actually dedicating time to this. And I remember one specific person who was like, bummed out because she was super like excited about the product and everything like that. However, you just have to think about the larger, larger perspective, which is your life and your careers on the, pa uh, on the line here to be able to build something meaningful and you need to survive. And um, if this person is not going to pay you to run this company, then they don't have any justification to say that you need to keep building this out. Um, so it was a very tough decision because it was a it, the product was really a baby of mine that I had incepted from the beginning. But um, the big mistake was that I didn't take into consideration of the problem that we were solving and the type of demographic or the customers that we really wanted to target. And so um, there was just not enough justification from those users uh, to say that we should continually build this, even as much as they were using it or even like loving it. They're just without the revenue or the sales or some sort of monetization strategy. Um, and, and just solely depending on like funding, it would be very dangerous for us to continue like that. Interesting. Um, how did you choose the new monetization strategy? Um, 
Yeah, yeah I mean, you're so it around one client. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, one of the easy monetization strategies um, is like a SaaS model, right? You pay a, mon a monthly subscription. So when we were releasing it, there was when we were releasing Tint, there was definitely a lot of other um, avenues to go. Was it a one-time fee? Uh, was it a recurring fee? Or was there you know, no fee, but we definitely injected ads now into there because when they embed it on their websites, there's extra exposure. So there's definitely a lot of monetization strategies. Um, what I wanted to, to do was to start with something simple and just start testing it out. And um, my, my, my premise was to actually just try something and not try to over-engineer it or try to perfect it. And the data would then allow me to validate that this was something working or not. So we just asked the first few clients, like, hey, we're thinking about charging $10 a month. Would you pay for that? And they said yes. And so we would start charging them, and then we would realize, like, okay, now that they've been in here, maybe we can actually charge more. And so uh, let's ask if we could charge $50, $100, $500 a month. And that's where the monetization strategy started getting involved. Um, but it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't tested that out properly. How, did, um, how does it look uh, for you when you raise the price? Um, do you... <laughs> yeah. Do you have grandfathered in pricing, or what is that? Yes. Is that so to answer your question, we do grandfather all old uh, customers to their original uh, pricing plan. Um, with that, we say that you know no new features will be added because you're on a grandfather plan, and so that grandfather plan means that it's just it is what it is, and you pay the exact same thing. We're not going to force you out of that, but it is what it is, um, and it's a it's a token of appreciation for your support from the early days. Um, however, a funny story was about February of 2014, um, we had about six months of runway left and we needed to try to raise a series A because we just needed to, but we, on February, um, we actually started charging people because, because we were like, okay, shoot, we need money. We're going to start charging people because we're providing them true value and we're going to start to try to raise money to buy ourselves a little bit more time. Uh, went through about 14 different investors, just wasn't able to sell them, whether it's because of my lack of vision or just my first time entrepreneurial background, I just wasn't able to close a deal with them. And so come about a uh, March, uh, end of March-ish, um, after all those meetings finished and we couldn't get a bite, um, I went to my developer and I was like, hey, uh, we need to go to the pricing page and just add a zero to all the pricing plans. And we need to increase the price because uh, we're going to die or we're going to run out of cash. Um, so we did that. We kept all the grandfather plans as it was. Um, uh, but then, so that didn't really spark any challenges from the current customers, but like even old, even like new customers that were coming in that saw the old pricing, the way to attack that is like, okay, since you saw the old pricing, we'll give you that pricing and just like let that go. Within a few weeks, no, no one will keep arguing against that anymore. And then you'll just have a new fresh batch of leads or customers or prospective clients that see the new pricing and won't question that anymore. It's interesting because uh, that's what we've been doing at Inspire Reads too, just like slowly inching the prices up. Um, yeah. How do you, you're saying that customers have no issue with the new pricing. Was there ever a time where you increased it too much and then you saw conversion rates go down or... How do you determine how much to raise it by? Yeah, so I, I I believe that pricing is never a there's never a right right answer. It's what you believe as a gut feeling first, and then you release it. Um, or you can talk to some customers beforehand who are actually paying you, and you think about increasing it just to gauge some thoughts. You got to make a call, and then just like let the market like react and tell you what's right or wrong. Um, yeah, we increased prices by 10 times and there were definitely people who are really pissed and they're like, wow, you're really ripping people off. But like, you can always justify it by um, having the argument of you know, maybe how much time you're saving them or how much cost you're saving them from needing to hire someone to build this out themselves or even need to maintain it even after if they build it out. So if you can find justifications around that, um, the argument becomes very clear that this is a value add at a smaller price point than they would be uh, doing if they had to build it themselves and maintain it themselves. Well, the question then is, um, why 10x and not 100x raise on the price? Yeah, um, for us, we it was there was a there was an interesting conscious decision on this one, which was if we 100x it or 50x it, we would have been higher than our competitors, which we knew our product was not there yet. Um, and so a lot of it is like the product speaks for itself, but also people like to buy from people they like. And as much as I feel like people can like me, I don't know if I can justify that 50 X price or whatever that would be, um, without the product being on par as well. Um, because in the end they're buying the product, um, from, uh, from a person they enjoy or, or they like. So, um, 10 X seemed like the, at that time seemed like the right answer for us. And again, it wasn't that it was, if it was going to be uh, right or wrong, we just needed, that was a gut feeling 
talk to some customers about it, and then release it to um, gauge what the response would be. Awesome. Let's um let's talk about growth because getting the original product to fifteen hundred users B two C that's a whole different model than what finding these paying customers that'll pay uh, for a B two B product. Yeah. Um, so how did growth change, and how did that entire strategy change for you, or is it the same? Yeah. So in the beginning, um, well, first. Shifting from B2C to B2B is a whole different strategy. Um, the type of marketing you do and the type of sales you do is completely different now. Um, an example is from B2C is like a lot of brand marketing, a lot of user acquisition, um, growth hack, uh, hacks, um, anything you can do to just get in front of eyeballs. That's that's really the main thing for for I think for B2C um, uh, companies. However, on the B2B, it's actually there's some interesting formulas that you can follow, which basically means. Find ways to market effectively to the exact type of customer who's going to buy from you. Define a sales cycle or sales process, and then close it um, as quickly as you can and most effectively. And so there was definitely a whole new learning curve for me to adopt because um, I was so used to just like a lot of press articles, um, a lot of influencer marketing for B two C companies like we we were. But now it's more so look at LinkedIn for like prospective buy- buyers, get referrals from. Um, uh, buyers that already were clients um, do a lot of interesting content marketing that would reach to your target market. So it was very geared towards like who is your buyer and what's the best, most efficient, and cost efficient way to reach them. So what was the most surprising thing about that uh, change? Yeah, um, a big. Uh, so there was two I'd say that um, that really helped us out, which was SEO and content marketing. So they kind of go hand in hand, but <clears throat> as a small startup. Because you have such a little budget to go invest in so much in marketing, you have to find scalable ways that are very cost efficient. So those two were very useful for us. So what I did was once a week, um, I would blog about something related to our industry or something that I knew our buyers would probably be looking for and essentially put our name in front of them. Um, and then with that, uh, our SEO started growing where we would write a lot about social media walls or social media hubs, um, keywords that really um, attached uh, to our brand and our product. Um, and so slowly but surely, we started getting more inbound leads coming in versus me having to go out there. At the same time, when that was ramping up, I would look through LinkedIn and look for you know, digital managers or social media specialists or communication directors. Those are the titles I knew would be purchasing from us. Um, and then reaching out to them, asking if they would like a demo or they would like a free trial so they can um, really feel confident that this would be a product that they would, uh, they would use and find value of. So this is something I've been obsessed with recently. So when you were going there uh, through LinkedIn um, and sending your messages, like how many were you sending per day? Um, I'd probably say at least 20 to 30 at the very start um, because I needed to find ways to get to their email and then I would want to make sure I craft uh, messages that were very catered to them and I would do actual research about who they were or anything that they were interested in or even past projects. Anything that I can blow to their ego um, was my goal. So then they would actually read it and then even respond to me. So that definitely took a lot of time, which is why about 20, maybe 100 leads per week was something I was trying to achieve and aim for. Were you outsourcing that at all or was that all you? No, everything was me. Um, and so I, I, I purposely made that decision because I wanted to learn uh, the process from the ground up of like who our buyer profile would be, what's the most effective way to reach them, what is the type of messaging in my email that I want to craft that will get them to respond and be interested in us. And then even during the demo, I would make sure that we had that relationship set since the beginning so that I could learn about them, they can learn about us, and, and it would create that relationship in a more strong way that give them the confidence to purchase from us. So how much, um, how much of those... Uh, outreach messages. You said they were super personalized. Were there any templates involved at all, or what did like what did one of those look after like? After a while, yeah, after a while, there were definitely some template structure that I would have, so that um, maybe like in the first line, it would be something I found about something I found about them about their interests, and then um, talk about the product, and then maybe then shed some light of like why we're why we're something that they it's worth their time, and then I keep it super short, have a very fascinating like can't miss subject line and then send it off and then have a follow-up process every two days to make sure that they um, just get back to me with a yes or a no. That's interesting, yeah. That's pretty much the same uh, tactics that I, I teach and the same stuff we use over here. Sure, that's very effective. Um, why LinkedIn versus email or um, cold calling or social media or any of these other outreach channels? So LinkedIn was a, uh, was a source that I used for um, 
at least just identifying who the buyers could be. Um, uh, beyond that, there was definitely very interesting tactics to employ on social media. So like you can follow them and just at mention them and just like it's a very public conversation. So that's there's more likelihood that they'll reach out back to you. I didn't do any cold calls because one, I was afraid of it at that time. And two, I just didn't think it was as scalable as I wanted it to be. Um, and so I just didn't go down that path. I'm not saying that it's not effective. It just wasn't an effective method for myself that I identified as um, one of my strengths. Um, so I went the sort of very personalized email. And then even like, let's say they were interested in, in hopping on a call, I definitely would hop on a call. But there was at least some um, some sort of warm introduction already that I could use uh, from the emails that we had exchanged conversations on. Did you find that your tactics were different um, based on the company size? Like. Uh Going after larger enterprise. Uh, Definitely. Well, it's like not only the company size, but the title as well. Um, so if you had a CMO, you would go very, very high level and just really humanize yourself and not try to sell them because they're super busy. And that's something I've learned is now with our company, like, and I'm super busy, like, I tend to resonate with people who just like empathize with the, the schedule that I have and the things that I need to just understand very quickly. Um, and then just like make sure that it doesn't seem like it's a sale. It's more of a relationship building. Um, so definitely really dependent on the type of company, the size of company, uh, maybe the industry, and then the, the title. What about like number of follow-ups or things like that? Um, did, like are startups easier to sell for for you? Is enterprise, like how, how did you find that uh, perfect spot? Sure. Um, I would say that it was, so we were targeting more small to medium-sized businesses at that time. Nothing in the technology startup space because that, that, wasn't what, what, that wasn't our market that we were selling to. But I would try to get to the, so for us in the beginning, it was either the website owner who was like the IT guy or the CEO or the marketing like director. Those were like the three main type of, uh, you know, titles that we try to go for. And really that's just to shed some light of like how important it is to target the right person um, when trying to sell uh, to them. What did your, um, so what did the rest of your day look like? So let's say you're sending out 30 of these outreach uh, messages every single day. What were you doing with the rest of the time? Yeah, so in the morning, I would check emails to see if I got any um, responses from the previous day's uh, blast. Um, I would get some and then try to set up some time. Um, in the, the rest of the morning, I would try to send out the new batch. In the afternoon, I probably had some demos already set up for that. Um, in the later afternoon, I probably look at support to make sure that the existing clients or the users that we were using were attended to as well. And then in the nighttime, I would uh, do some research on who the next batch that I should be targeting as well. So that was like my schedule during that during that phase. How long did that go on for? I'd say so. We so we started monetizing in February of 2014. I think that went all the way until the end of the end of 2014. Um, uh, until the time that I actually brought on um, a few more employees to help me with that. That's interesting. Um, so the, are the employees as effective as, as you were when you were doing it? Definitely took some training and just share, shedding some light of like how I'm doing it. Um, I do give a lot of opportunity for them to put in their own taste and their own sort of like personality to that. Um, I just share sort of like best practices and then I sort of monitor to make sure that it's working and then, and then let them do what they need to do. How do you... Um... Two questions, I guess. How did you find the yeah. people that you hired to do sales? And then the second question is, how did you uh, vet them during the interview process? Sure. So uh, the first one, at least uh, the first few people that joined us were, um, they found us on either websites that were using us or um, they read a blog about our when we were like doing a lot of content marketing. Um, so that was a good sign because they showed interest in it. And I actually didn't do any like outbound poaching or anything like that until we were at least like 15 or 20 people. Um, so a lot of the first few employees were people who found about, who heard about us or found us through uh, uh, someone using our, our platform. Um, and then after that, we had to start an interview process. And that interview process in the beginning was very, very scrappy. It was more so just like get a quick call or interview with like their skill set to just like see if they were actually competent. Then the second one that was what I try to call and what is today a culture interview. So like just getting a gauge of like, can they vibe well with us and can we vibe well with them to grow together and, some, and build something meaningful. And then finally we did a team interview, which was like, while I did the first two steps for like maybe a salesperson, um, I bring my other two co-founders in because that was only us to make sure they, they met them as well so that we were, you know, we were all on the same page and they found things that maybe I didn't see and bring that to my attention and so on and so forth. Um, and then so fast forward to today, that's sort of what our 
any of our interview process still is, but it's a lot more flushed out with set questions. So we have um, the process goes like we do a qualifying call to make sure that this is someone who's actually interested in us and has actually done some research. Um, and so the idea is like if they're willing to invest some time into our company, then we're willing to invest time in them as well. So do a qualifying call, then we set up a skill set interview if they pass a qualifying call. A skill set interview has challenges that we present to them depending on which role they, they are in. If they pass that, then they go to a culture interview with me, um, and that's a, like a 45-minute chat about like just understanding like where they see their fit with us and where they see their, their career trajectory and just like understanding everything not related to their day-to-day. And then the last one would be a team interview. And this is the big evolving part here where now we're at 40 people. You can't have 40 people step into a room and like interview someone just because that, that, that would just be very, very um, intense. That would be awesome. So we actually, like one person yeah, and then right. like everybody else is on like chairs we around had them. That. We actually had that up until like 15 people. And then someone mentioned like, hey, I don't think this is effective anymore. So what we did was we fired a Google Hangout um, and camera just to like watch the interview so people can spectate. So then they can still understand the... <laughs> The candidate but they just can't speak and we have sort of like five representatives from multiple departments like one representative from multiple departments five max uh, to just kind of who would be working with this individual the most to be able to be in this what we call a committee to make a decision on this hiring what are um what are some of the challenges that you put through uh the salespeople when you're hiring them <laughs> yeah um the challenge is one of the big challenges is build a tint um, on our platform uh, of a client that you would love to see be using tint and sh- like use as many features that are relevant to this and um, this is a-, a test to show like do they understand the product um, and then they try to basically try to sell to us with that brand so like if they chose like Nike then we'd be like a marketing director at Nike and they would create that tint and then try to sell us why we as a marketing manager at Nike would want to purchase the, the software adapter. Awesome. Um, so it's not actual outreach or anything, it's like demo. Yeah, it's like a demo. Okay. It's like a demo that uh, proves their competency and being able to um, sort of control the situation with like random questions that may arise to what we've always heard and how they can handle that pressure. That's interesting. What I really like about that is that you, you systematize the whole thing, like you have it all laid out. We have, and the, the premise behind that is that um, I think a good company all starts with the people, obviously the product as well, but outside the product, it starts with the people and then the people start with the interview process. So if you can get that and nail down, nail down a proper interview process, it'll make your life easier from then on. Because if you bring on someone not a good fit, um, it'll just impact your, your bottom line or your company just like very poorly and it slows you down. And so really it starts with the interview process, which is why we systematize that. How's that compared to the, uh, to the customer interview process, like bringing on new clients? Do you do a similar vetting? <laughs> Um, for customers, I think it's, I would imagine it's quite the opposite where we're trying to convince them that this is something that they want to use. And so, um, oh, but you're saying like if they inbound, yeah, so it's very similar where they, we have an inbound qualifier so that they qualify the call to make sure that this is someone who's actually very interested in the product and then we'll pass them off to an account executive to close the deal. And after that's closed then we pass it off to a customer success manager to, um, nurture the deal. So just standard SaaS, you guys aren't doing proposals or anything like that? We have proposals that the the account executives send out after the demo, um, but it's but our pricing is very transparent and our plans are all very transparent. So, and our product is actually very self serve. So, what we're here to do is really make sure they understand the full value add we can provide, and then guide them towards the the best deal that um, they they see on our website. It's interesting. Okay, we're getting pretty close to time. Um, All right. Any parting wisdom? Let's say somebody is, is in a similar situation to you. They're in a B2C company, um, founder of it. Maybe it's uh, not growing the way they want it to, to yeah. grow and they want to move to B2B. What are some things that they should be looking to do? Yeah, so one, one big thing I've, I've realized, and I've shared this in some other um, interviews before, but I think it really holds true, and it's really hard to do. It's much easier said than done, so I'm definitely qualifying that, is that it all starts with the problem. And what I realized was if you can define the problem and actually make sure that um, it, is a, it is a legitimate problem and you have like maybe some variety of solutions, I think like three potential solutions that you can present to um, the prospective client, um, I think the rest will take care of itself. What, when, what I mean by that is if you can solve a problem, then there'll be definitely demand for it. Revenue will come in. You'll be able to grow the team um, and so on and so forth. So I think the rest takes care of itself so long as you define the problem very uh, strong in the beginning and you make sure you offer some 
multiple solution offerings to your client. Maybe it's just a phone call and maybe it's just ideas on drawn on napkins. And so they can tell you like, that's exactly what I want. And if you find something that has a trend of, of the amount of times people say that they want, you keep validating that with maybe like five more customers or prospective customers and just make sure you have enough data points. I would say like 10 to 20 data points of like consistent answers is a good part, is a good point to justify that this is something that people would want. Um, and then the last advice beyond that is always try to attach um, a price to it where people always say they will always use anything. You tell me you built something, will I use it? Yes, I'll, I'll say I'll use it because I'm a nice person or you're my friend. Um, but people will definitely tell you the truth when money comes in comes into play. And um, it's because it's their hard-earned money and they want to make sure it's going through something that provides value to them. And so if you hear consistent answers of, yeah, I would use this, um, you know, let me know when it's out. You can say, like, we're, we're going to charge blank amount of dollars uh, per month or just one time, whatever it is. I'm going to charge you $500 a month for that. Now, now, after that, you will hear the exact answer you need. And it may not be the nice answer. It might not be the best answer because they might shoot you down. But that's actually a better thing to know that you are building, th that you prevented yourself from building something that people would never pay for. Awesome. Well, Thanks for uh, thanks for being on. This was a very interesting interview, um, and there's a lot of takeaways <laughs> here. I think you're absolutely welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, oh, actually, one last thing I always do for every interview is um, should anybody hear this and, and be interested in chatting more, I do offer my email just because I'm a big fan of helping others. So uh, my personal email is just tim at tintup dot com, t i m at t i n t u p dot com, and um, you can have them and, uh, email me, and I'm happy to help out. Perfect. Tim at tintup.com. And also, yep. tintup.com is, is Tim's uh, company if you want to check that out also. Thanks for Thank being on. Thank you so on. much. You're very welcome. Bye. Thanks for listening to the interview. And if you need more leads for your startup, agency, or B2B company, check out inspirebeats.com. We do targeted lead generation and outreach for B2B.